Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome to volume five of Virtual Nightlife. My name is Laura. I will be your host this evening. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a public programs presenter at the California Academy of Sciences. Um, you may have seen myself or even some of my fellow presenters doing the penguin feedings or the coral reef dives or even snake encounter, if you've ever visited our wonderful museum. Um, and speaking of snake encounter. I'd like to introduce you to our co-host this evening. This is Darwin. He is a corn snake and he's going to be hanging out with us for the evening and we're going to learn a little bit more about snakes um, and snake information as we go through our program this evening. He's a little bit wiggly which is good. He's very excited to see you all. And thank you so much for joining us. Now for volume five of Nightlife, uh, it's a little bit different now, right? Because we're virtual. Usually we're able to gather together under our living roof and maybe congregate and talk about science and be with fellow science lovers. But since we are not able to do so right now, we wanna bring it to you. While we're staying indoors, we are gonna be talking about the outdoors for our nightlife this evening. We have a whole slew of wonderful guests that are gonna be talking about everything from ants to coral reefs to the Antarctic and even give you some camping tips. So without further ado, I say we just jump right on into it. Our first guest is Colin Ford. He's a marine biologist and part of the sci art duo called Coral Morphologic. And he's gonna be sharing Coral City Camera Project with us. So take it away, Colin. All right, uh, thanks for having me. And uh, I'm joining you guys from Miami, Florida, uh, AKA the Coral City. And uh, I'm going to introduce you to a project that we just launched in early February before we ever had in any anticipation that uh, we were all gonna be stuck at home away from nature, um, away from the museums that we love to go to. But uh, it, it turns out this camera that we've uh, deployed underwater here uh, at the tip of Port Miami, uh, 
if you guys could queue up the Google Earth image, I want to give you sort of a, a so we are, the camera is at, at the red point, so we can zoom down to the southeastern tip of Florida. And want you guys to kind of have some perspective as to where exactly, well, we might need to go over there. So what you're looking at right here is um, you got Miami Beach there on the on the right hand side. Um, you've got Miami that's just off screen, and then you have the Port of Miami, and at the easternmost tip there is where our camera is. So you can zoom down just a little bit further. Um, and so all, if you've ever gone on a cruise, all of uh, the ships go past this camera, um, and all of the cargo coming in out of Miami. Um, is also going past there. So it's a place where you'd never imagine there to be a thriving ecosystem. But uh, part of my work um, doing marine life surveys over the past decade uh, revealed that it was anything but kind of a, a lifeless uh, industrial zone. And um, so we had this idea to put a camera down because we have access to land, uh, we have access to high speed internet, um, and it's a really amazing non-invasive way to be able to observe nature. Um, and as far as we know, it is the only live streaming uh, webcam that is currently operating from a coral reef environment. So um, it's called the Coral City Camera. You can tune in at CoralCityCamera.com or you can search for it on YouTube. But I want to show you guys some of the, the highlights um, because we've seen uh, as of today, we hit 105 species of fish, um, which is which is really exciting. That's since February. Um, but you know, besides fish, we have all kinds of other critters. So uh, why don't we go take a look at what uh, some of these perspectives are are looking like and some of the the creatures that we've that we've seen. So here uh, is a little school of reef squid, or perhaps better, uh, a squad of squid. Um, recorded this, I guess, about last week. Um, you know, they're just about as, as alien of creatures as you could possibly imagine. Sometimes they come, come over and they get up close to the camera, almost as if they're, they're, they're checking it out. Um, and you can see that there's some blocks there. So those are actually coral transplantation blocks that the uh, Miami-Dade County put underwater about a little over a decade ago to serve as a site for transplantation if they have to do uh, projects um, where they have to move corals. So let's take a look at the, at the next film. So probably one of the most charismatic creatures uh, that we have here I love to see are the porcupine puffer fish. Um, we probably have, there's at least about half a dozen of them. They're all a little bit different. This guy was really just a cutie. And again, you know, sometimes they just come down and look at the camera whether they're actually kind of aware of what's going on inside or not, I don't know, but I'd like to think that they're making eye contact with us. Um, let's take a look at the next one. So this is another perspective. So that we can rotate the camera remotely 360 degrees around inside of its glass housing. Um, and so this is a, a perspective kind of looking more, more south. And you can see we, we have a pretty diverse assemblage of, uh, of reef fish. Um, you know, all of the, all of your favorite characters are there. We've got angelfish, butterfly fish, lots of parrotfish. It's remarkable how many parrotfish are there. Um, take a look, go to the next one. So here's uh, another, this is looking west, uh, back towards the port. And as you see coming into view here, it's not a mermaid but it is a manatee. Um, it's almost like they use this as a, as a manatee highway. Of course, you know, manatees are um, at risk from getting hit by boats. Um, and it's almost as if they've learned that the best way to avoid those boats is to hug the shoreline, which means that they pretty much swim right past our camera. And we see manatees um, probably on average at, at least once a week, if not more. And of course, I'm sure we're missing uh, plenty that are passing when we're not looking at the perspective that they might be passing. So manatees are always really exciting. Of course, they're an endangered species. Um, and so that's really, uh, it's always encouraging when we see some endangered species. 
And uh, let's take a look at the next one. What do we got? I think we might have another manatee. Oh, yes. This was, uh, this was a real eye-opener. Um, as, the, as the guy that has to go to, to do service and maintain uh, the camera to see a, a lemon shark uh, of that size uh, pass by the camera was, is, was pretty, pretty alarming. But uh, at the same time, it's also really amazing to see, um, to see a shark kind of coming into the city and, and not a small shark. That's, that's probably, um, you know, at least uh, seven or eight feet long. So much bigger than, much bigger than me. Um, and so I always make sure that I, I go to service the camera when the water's really clear. So, I, so the, the shark can see me and I can see the shark and, and we can keep our, our, our safe social distan distancing. What do we got next here? So this is uh, this is our. Um, you can see there's a, a nursery in the background, but just watch what happens here. This is a school of bait fish, um, and then obviously behind the bait fish now, we've got a school of creval jacks. And um, you know, I mean, these are sort of the the scenes that you'd expect uh, out of um, you know BBC uh, Blue Planet documentary and yet you know this is this is right here right along our urban shorelines in Miami so it's uh, and of course it's also really encouraging to see these big schools of bait fish because they are kind of uh, the foundation of the larger ecosystem um, and so that's really really great to see take a look at the next one um, oh this was so exciting um, sea turtle this is a green sea turtle um, and again, I've never seen a sea turtle underwater uh, in this environment myself. So then to be able to see it on camera was really like a, a totally unexpected, um, though not particularly surprising. I, I knew it was just a matter of time before we'd, we'd see one. And this guy's a, probably like a teenage, uh, a teenage scootin green sea turtle. Um, and let's see, what do we, what do we got next? Ah, so that, that fish that just went past there, we call that, we, that's oval. Um, an oval is a doctor fish that is missing its tail. But uh, what's going on here is we've got a couple of French grunts. Um, they are probably males. Um, and you can see there goes oval, looking just like an oval. And then the, the French grunts have a, a kind of like a, a dominance display where they open up their mouths and, and they're bright red inside and they, they kind of uh, square off with each other. So whenever we get to catch that on the camera, that's always uh, really exciting to see. It's almost like we're spying on, on the secret lives of these fish, which I think is really cool. And uh, so this is a, another look at, the, at this uh, research nursery that we have um, deployed just kind of away from the rock work. Um, and we're working with researchers from NOAA, the National Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric Administration, as well as scientists from the University of Miami, to try and understand how the corals are surviving in this environment where you'd never expect corals uh, to thrive. And the fact that there are populations of corals that have naturally recruited to these shorelines, um, you know, suggests that, that these, these are kind of the evolutionary pioneers. Um, and so we're trying to study these corals to better understand how they are so resilient and adaptive to these uh, kind of anthropogenic human influenced um, habitats. And so we've got this nursery here. There's uh, 30 fragments of brain corals uh, that we, I think we put those on in maybe January. Um, and tomorrow is a, a very exciting milestone I'm transplanting 25 fragments of the endangered staghorn coral, which is, uh, you know, one of the most iconic um, and important reef building species uh, in the Caribbean. So we're working with uh, another organization called Rescue Reef that's based out of the University of Miami. It's uh, like a citizen science um, program where they have a coral nursery in Biscayne National Park. And uh, they bring those, we're gonna bring fragments from their nursery to this closer inshore nursery to try and see if we can identify the most resilient coral strains that they have, sort of like a stress test. Um, and we're just getting started. You know, the summertime is, is usually when corals are really put to the, to the test when the water heats up. Um, you're probably familiar with, with coral bleaching. 
So we're going to get some of these corals in this nursery. We're going to be watching them over the coming months, and hopefully that will help inform uh, the researchers, uh, focus their efforts on the most resilient genotypes of that particular uh, endangered corals that's so important to our reefs here in Florida. Um, so I think that that's all of the, the, the videos and slides that I have. So I encourage everyone uh, to check it out, coralcitycamera.com. Um, it streams 24 seven. So if you were to tune in right now, you're gonna see um, the, the night. Um, but uh, if, you, if you tune in during the daytime, um, you know, there's, there's people from all around the world that are, that are now tuning in and you can uh, be a citizen scientist We've had several species that were new to us be reported by watchers. Uh, they leave comments. Uh, we have a timestamp in the lower right-hand corner. So if you see anything interesting, please let us know. Everyone um, is really appreciative. We have a little community of, of wildlife watchers that you can do from anywhere in the world. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. And um, I hope everybody is, is staying healthy. And uh, I look forward to being able to come out and, and visit the Cal Academy of Sciences when we can all get back to normal. So thank you guys and have a good night. Thank you so much, Colin, that was amazing. I'm always fascinated by the fact that there's so much life in the coral reef, so much biodiversity. You can find pretty much anything from fish to coral itself and even um, the algae that lives inside of coral. It's truly fascinating. One other thing that is very biodiverse, since we have him right here, Darwin, if you're just tuning in, is our co-host this evening. He is a corn snake and he's only one of the about 3,000 different types of snakes in the world. Corn snakes, ooh, sorry, getting a little wiggly. Again, he's very excited to be here. But corn snakes are found in southeastern portions of North America, and they're called corn snakes because they have a very unique pattern on their scoots or their bottom scales. It's a little bit hard to see right here because of Darwin's coloration, but his pattern looks like maize or native corn. So that's why they're called corn snakes. And there's 3,000 different types of snakes in the world. It's pretty amazing. They're found all over the place. And again, if you are into citizen science, just like Colin was talking about, if you are gonna go outside when we can all do so safely together, feel free to go looking for coral, looking for snakes and let us know about it. We are very interested to help make sure we can figure out what is out there and help us better understand all the different types of ecosystems and biodiversity around us. But speaking of biodiversity, we are going to go right into our next topic, our next speaker, who is Dr. Brian Fisher, our curator of entomology at the California Academy of Sciences. And he is going to be talking about ant dating. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to tonight, Radio For Me. Radio For Me, it's, it's French, if you're not aware. Radio For Me, it's one of the oldest, longest produced Bay Area ant news programs, sponsored by antweb.org. It's for those who love ants, or for those who want to learn more about ants. Now, before we begin our most important and favorite part of the show, Dating for Ants, I will first cover some of the news in the ant community. Now, we offer now a, a live coverage of COVID, social distancing in ants in this time of crisis. Now, ants are social. They know all about social. You don't often see ants with a selfie or ants drinking alone, but you do now. Why? Well, for a while now, ants have been suffering from COSIT. There's a fungus called cordyceps that turned ants into zombies, and it's an infectious disease transmitted from one ant to the next. How have ants dealt with this? How have they changed their lives? How have they adapted to this killer that's turning zombies? Now, these ants, once they're attacked by these spores, you don't know it at first. They're asymptomatic. 
You'll have your sister there, your friend, your best friend. One day, she'll start acting different. It changes her behavior. In fact, the behavior is such that she'll leave the nest at noon. And all of them will go up into a tree and their mandibles will grab onto a stick and this fungal spore will blossom to transmit more zombie spores, more cordyceps across to other ants unaware. So ants have had to learn to deal with this, to find ways to adapt their communities. But first off, let's overview that you may think at first being an ant is easy peasy, that it's only cordyceps, the COVID disease that may be a problem, but there are many problems that you have to actually figure out that it's COVID or not COVID. For example, you could have a fly, a Ford fly, laying an egg in your head capsule. And like the cordyceps, you may be completely normal, but then one day your head will pop off and a little Ford baby will pop out and fly away. So if your head hurts, it could be the Ford fly and not COZIT. Now COZIT has been impacting ants in lots of ways. In fact, they may be moving their nest more often because of COZIT infections, or they could be even stranging where they put their nest. In fact, there are many ants in the deserts of Southern California, Arizona, where if you go on a satellite view, you'll see the ant mounds have been actually equally dis dispersed across the landscapes. In fact, roughly about 10 square meters distant between each of these nests. This could be an adaptation for their life as victims of COZID. But recently, our very own mayor of London, of, of, uh, of San Francisco, London Breed, decided to turn to the ants for advice. And our busy consultants, the engineers of Pogata Myrmex, the seed harvester ants, have helped actually redesign our play areas across San Francisco. You may have noticed in Dolores Park these circles. Well, if you're an ant, you would recognize this. In fact, we were starting getting alerts from the ant community, like what's going on? Who are these new ants? Well. We assert everybody, it's not new ants, it's actually our ant community helping those who live in San Francisco. We're teaching them how to be a socially distant organism. In fact, ants for a long time are social bubbles that actually have, in fact, their number one enemy being another social bubble. So they've learned to keep their distance. So thank you, Pogda Mermex, been very helpful. And now I think for the most important part of the show tonight is actually Love Picnic, where we highlight some of the most important, interesting candidates that are on the social love app, Love Picnic. Now things have changed for Love Picnic and we wanna actually reveal how the COVID epidemic has changed behaviors of mating. Special thanks to our San Francisco poet, Janine Latine, who has helped us devise the beauty of these words. She's taking ant descriptions, a guidebook of the ants of North America and turn them into a beautiful story about love. Now, here we are, we have actually two ants from Australia where they have less rules right now. They're actually opening up their society. So they're on Zoom right now with their special backdrops, Myrmecia and Mesostroma and They've met and I, I, I wish them a long life together, but I actually want to actually review some of the details that make ants special and unique in the dating scene. So bear with me now as we dig into some of the features of ants and discuss some of their hangups or look at that as advantages of being an ant. Let's look at our beautiful Southern Arizona leafcutter ant in the genus Addis, Atta. Um, she goes by the nickname Fungus Fever, and she tells us what she's reading. She's reading the, 220, the 2020 Farmer's Almanac, and also Fungus Farming for Dummies. What is she good at? My nest mates voted me best leaf cutter of 2019, oops, but I think I'm most talented at growing 
shrooms. We won't ask what kind of shrooms those are. And this is my favorite, my personal favorite. This is a Bay Area special, Vampire Girl Stigmatoma. You notice she's a girl. In fact, all these workers, these ants are actually female. In a colony, you have a queen, and all the workers you see running out are actually female. And here she says, the most private thing I'm willing to admit here, I drink the blood of my own offspring. We call it non-destructive cannibalism. Well, these vampire ants don't uh, eat in the normal way. They actually eat the blood of their babies. Now, this is an interesting story about ants. You always, you ever wonder why ants bring food back to the nest? Well, they bring the food back to the nest to actually feed their larva, their babies. They can't eat solid food. That's why they bring it back. And they feed their larva. And then normally, most ants, the larva, the babies, regurgitate it. And a few ants take that regurgitated juice and walk around and offer it to the other ants. However, these vampire ants, the Dracula ant, actually each ant, even the queen, must find a larva, scratch it until it bleeds, and drink the baby's blood. Let's continue with Vampire Girl, what I'm doing with my life. I spend most of the time underground, out of the sun, to the point where my eyes are absent. Yes, many of these ants are blind. They live underground. For most of us, they're invisible. Now, now or never. This is that Pogonomyrmix ant. It's a male. This is the first male you've seen. Actually, males don't live very long. They actually are born with wings. They fly, they mate, and then they die. They may live just a few weeks. And after flying, they may live just hours. So they're always in a hurry. The most prim primitive thing I'm willing to admit here, I want my first and last time to be special. My self-summary. I spend all day on a hilltop with a bunch of other males, ants, waiting for females. These Pogonomyrmix or seed harvester ants, the males, are cued in by a rainfall or during a certain time of the year, they fly out and hover around a bush or a hilltop, and then they call the female, come to it. And here's the female. She goes by the name CD, and it says here, you should text me if you want to spend a warm day in the desert sun collecting seeds. This is what Pogonomyrmix eats. I'm always looking for a new patch of sage scrub to check out and heck, maybe we'll find some dead beetles to scavenge along the way. The most private thing I'm willing to admit here, I discharge mandibular gland secretions when arriving at a mating site. That's the cinch it in with the males. Now, this is actually an ant. This is another male ant now in side view. She's called One Track. And she's from Madagascar. And my self-summary, I've got one thing on my mind in 24 hours to get it done. We won't go into any more details there. But let's sum it up. That ants are out there. They're everywhere. They're all different. And they've been helping our society. And we've been overlooking them. But I just wanted to share with you some of the exciting world of ants. So thank you again, and I hope we're all safe and that the COVID never gets to us and stays with the ants. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. I got to say, those profiles were pretty impressive. And I would argue that snakes are pretty good at social distancing as well. For the most part, during their adult uh, or, ooh, excuse me, their adulthood, they are solitary animals, meaning that they stay by themselves and only really have to come together during mating season. And although snakes don't really have access to the internet, they're not able to go and say snakedate.com and be able to find their lucky match, they do need to make sure that they are impressing their potential mate. So for instance, if two males were to find a female, they have to prove that one of them is a lot stronger, 
we're gonna give the female some healthy offspring. So how do they do that? What they're going to do is have a bit of a wrestling match. They're going to coil around each other and try to pin the other male snake's head down to the ground. Whomever is able to succeed is going to be dubbed the winner and will have more of a chance to mate with that female that they may have found. Pretty impressive. So Darwin, do you think you'd be able to do that? Yeah, I think that means yes. <laughs> All right, friends, we are going to go right into a little bit. I feel like it's pretty apt to go into this next segment because we're talking about dating, right? So what better way to impress a potential mate than to serenade them? So we are going to head over to Melvin Sings. He is going to give us a musical performance. Stuck on you, got this feeling down deep in my soul that I just can't lose. Girl, I'm on my way. Needed a friend, and the way I feel now, guess I'ma be the way you to the end. Girl, I'm on my way. Mighty glad you stay. Stuck on you, been a fool too long. I guess it's time for me to come on home. Girl, I'm on my way. It's crazy to see that a woman like you could wait around for a man like me. Girl, I'm on my way. Mighty glad you stay. Girl, I'm leaving on the midnight train tomorrow. And I know just where I'm going. Back on my troubles and I throw them all away. This time I'm leaving, coming on a stay. on you, got this feeling down deep in my soul that I just can't lose, girl I'm on my way, needed a friend, and a way up for now, guess I'ma be the way you to the end, girl I'm on my way, mighty glad you stayed. Mighty glad you stay. Oh, mighty glad you stay. Mighty glad you stay. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Melvin. That was beautiful. Now, while I was able to hear it, Darwin, not so much. Snakes have some pretty fascinating senses. They do have eyesight like we do. They are able to smell with their tongues and some of them even have heat vision, but they don't quite hear the way that we do. As you can see right here, if Darwin would like to show you, he doesn't have any ear openings on his head like we do on the sides of our, our own heads. So, how is he able to detect sound? Well, turns out snakes do have inner ear bones that pick up from vibrations. So if they do need to sense something, they might put their head down on a surface, maybe a rock, a log, even the ground itself. And that can help work with all of their other senses so they can anticipate maybe there's some potential prey around or maybe perhaps even a potential predator. That's pretty amazing. So if you'd like to listen to Melvin sing, he's going to come back um, toward the end of our program. But our next guest is going to be talking to us, excuse me, about her five-week expedition to find life under the ice. Hmm. 
I don't mean mysterious. It's Ariel Waldman. She is a NASA advisor and an Antarctic explorer. Hey everyone, so happy to be here. I'm calling in from San Francisco, so I'm not very far from the California Academy of Sciences. I'm really excited to be part of this virtual nightlife and I'm so glad you could all join me. So with that, I'm just gonna jump right in and talk about my Antarctic expedition. So um, if you can all see this slide, this is one of my absolutely favorite pictures from one of my favorite spacecrafts, Voyager 1, that's going to the outer reaches of our solar system and beyond. And if you can see that tiny little pale blue speck of a pixel there, that's Earth as seen from about 4 billion miles away. So that's where you can find me if you need me. And I do a lot of work in space exploration, but Despite that, my background is actually not in science or space exploration. I went to art school, my degree is in graphic design, and I sort of unexpectedly stumbled into space exploration. A few years ago, I was watching a documentary called When We Left Earth, which is a documentary about all the amazing things that NASA had to do in order to send humans into space for the very first time. And I got so incredibly inspired by this documentary that I sent someone at NASA an email saying that I was a huge fan of what they were doing and if they ever needed someone like me, uh, I was around. It was a geeky fangirl moment and I never really expected to ever hear back from them. But serendipitously, I was able to get a job at NASA from that email and it completely changed my life. It was absolutely amazing. And so really a lot of my career and a lot of what I do is around this concept that doing something changes how you see it. So actually doing science and space exploration changes your relationship with it from something of observation to something of active participation and contribution. It's something that people can participate in from all different disciplines. And so through NASA, I got to meet a lot of astronauts and interview them. And I ended up writing a book called What's It Like in Space? Stories from Astronauts Who've Been There. And it's all about kind of the silly stories about what it's like in space. And the more I learned about going into space, the more I realized that maybe I wasn't ready to go into space myself. I get motion sickness very easily. So going into space isn't really necessarily for me, at least not just yet. Um, so I wanted to know, like, what is my version of going into space? What is my extreme? And for me, that was Antarctica. So I really liked Antarctica because it's so similar to so many aspects uh, of space exploration and so many places in our solar system. But I didn't want to just go to Antarctica to uh, be a tourist. I wanted to actually contribute and actually bring value to exploring Antarctica. I wanted to be one of the nerds. But as I said, you know, I have a background in art. Uh, my background isn't in science. So I discovered that the National Science Foundation had an Antarctic artists and writers program that I ended up applying to. And even though I'm terrible at drawing, so I can't be like this woman who's sitting in the Antarctic just drawing beautiful pictures, I wanted to talk to scientists about what sort of things they would like to see, what things would be interesting to them. I wanted to do something that would sort of bring art and science together in a valuable way. And so I learned that actually a lot of researchers get sent down to Antarctica, study all the creatures down there, but they rarely take any photos or videos of what they're studying. Uh, and if they do, those photos go into a scientific publication and get put behind a paywall. So I decided to begin teaching myself microscopy so that I could uh, actually film a lot of the critters in Antarctica. A lot of times when people think about Antarctica, they think of a place that's barren and lifeless, but the reality is, is that Antarctica actually has tons of life, but most of it is microscopic. So I taught myself microscopy. I ended up getting certified in microscopy at, uh, at Merritt College, uh, the community college in Oakland. And I also joined the San Francisco Microscopical Society, a really fantastic uh, community organization here in San Francisco. And so after five years of trying, I actually got the grant to go. And this was the very first time that I actually got to see Antarctica with my own eyes. And it was just absolutely beautiful. I went down there on a C-17 military aircraft and it had no windows except for this very tiny porthole that you can see here. And this was the very first time that I actually got to see Antarctica. And so a lot of the places I explored was all about looking for life underneath the ice in Antarctica. So uh, this picture here is actually of a little fish hut 
uh, out on the sea ice, but it's not used for fishing. It's actually used for divers. So there are Antarctic divers that go below the nine feet thick sea ice and go into an incredibly cold water to explore. And at first I didn't know exactly why anyone would want to become an Antarctic diver. It sounded just absolutely freezing. Um, but I was able to discover why people do it. Uh, in Antarctica, there exists a metal pipe that you can see here, and you can actually go down this metal pipe and go underneath the sea ice. Uh, it's moving a little slow, but hopefully it'll pick up. Um, you can actually go on this metal pipe into the sea ice and underneath, and then at the bottom uh, is this. So when you get to the bottom of this metal pipe inserted into the sea ice, you can see all the amazing fish and underwater creatures. And what you see at the top is the illuminated ceiling of ice um, that's just coating everything. And so you're literally suspended between the seafloor and the sea ice. So this is what that looks like from the outside. It was just absolutely incredible and magical and amazing. Um, actually getting to uh, see underneath the sea ice and see why someone would want to be an Antarctic diver because it's absolutely beautiful. And some of the critters I found were amazing diatoms, which are glass single-celled algae with glass outer shells that are just amazing. Uh, this is a seed shrimp, also known as an ostracod, uh, just amazing little flippers and they're just delightful critters. And then I went further afield uh, to actually camp out in the dry valleys. And the dry valleys are the largest area of Antarctica where you can actually see what the continent of Antarctica looks like underneath all the ice and snow. Uh, the majority of Antarctica, around 98% of Antarctica is covered with ice and snow and it's nearly the size of North America. So the dry valleys are a really special place. And this picture here is me at the site of Blood Falls, which is a place that no one uh, thought had any life until just about the last decade. And then we discovered that that uh, red coloring is not life, it's iron oxide, but inside of that iron oxide coloring is actually bacteria. Um, there's just so many magical places in Antarctica to see. And so I also was able to hike up a glacier uh, that you can see here. I've never hiked up a glacier before, so this was a bit of an intense experience, but I was able to successfully hike up a glacier. And the reason why I wanted to get on top of a glacier is because we actually drilled down into this glacier and we drilled down into it because inside the glacier are just tons of microbes that live in these little dirt pucks all over the glacier. So we're drilling into the glacier, not just to get an ice core, but to get a dirt puck uh, core, which you'll see here in a moment. And in that dirt puck core are just tons of tiny animals and all sorts of creatures just living their best lives inserted inside of a glacier, which is just amazing. You can see that dirt puck right there. And so the outcome of uh, looking at that dirt puck for all the little critters inside of it are things like this. So this tardigrade was inside of that dirt puck. Tardigrades are also known as water bears, and they're just tiny animals that are famous for surviving extreme conditions like the vacuum of space. It turns out they can also survive inside of a glacier in Antarctica, which is just incredible. They're just so adorable. And then this is another example of a microbe that I was able to film uh, from that dirt puck inside that glacier. This is a rotifer and uh, it has one foot uh, on one of its end. And then it has this amazing crown uh, that it uses to sort of sweep in food like a Roomba. And it's just really all these just amazing creatures that exist all over Antarctica, but you just can't see them without a microscope. So all of my work and all of this stuff is all around the idea of breaking single narratives. The idea that there is only one way to do something or that if you pursued a discipline in something outside of science, that you can't do anything unless you drop everything and get a PhD. I'm not going to say it's necessarily easy to go between a lot of different disciplines. Sometimes you have to change people's minds, but the reality is, is that there's so many amazing things that you can contribute to science, even if it isn't your chosen career. And it's something where it's just value added. You can just do multiple things with your life. And a lot of times you're bringing value to other areas that people haven't even thought about. And the idea that there's only one way to be a scientist or one way to explore really needs to change. So finally, uh, all the uh, critters that I filmed in Antarctica, the result of all that work 
was that I put them together into a virtual microscope on the web called Life Under the Ice. You can look at it at lifeundertheice.org. And you can actually pan around and see all of these critters from Antarctica, zoom in and out of them, uh, explore what they are. There's a little what's this button next to them. And you can actually share your favorite microbes with friends as well. So it really gives you the experience of actually being able to explore and look around for microbes in Antarctica as if you were looking down the bar barrel of a uh, microscope and we're able to actually see everything. And it's just absolutely amazing. So finally, thank you all so much for joining me and all of us today. Uh, you can find out more on lifeundertheice.org where you can find all those amazing tardigrades and other critters. And also I filmed my entire expedition to Antarctica, uh, my entire five weeks that I spent there. Uh, if you wanna see what it's like to actually spend five weeks in Antarctica, you can go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Ariel Waldman, and you can watch the five episode mini series. Thank you all so much for tuning in, and this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Ariel. It's always wonderful to see how so much life can thrive in such extreme environments. While snakes have about 3,000 different species, um, as I mentioned before, and can be found all over the world, they aren't found in Antarctica. As reptiles, they are ectothermic or cold-blooded, so they're not able to make their own body heat. So it makes it a little bit difficult to be in very cold atmospheres, ecosystems, because it's very difficult to bring your body temperature up in order to make sure your metabolism is working properly. So snakes can be found in many other places in the world, from deserts to oceans, rainforests, even a park the Golden Gate Park, where the California Academy of Sciences is located. So if you go out into any place, you most likely would find a snake, unless you are also on a five-week expedition to Antarctica. But they can be found in so many places and therefore in so many different types of homes as well. Snakes can live underground in burrows that they either dig themselves or maybe even utilize after they've already eaten prey that have dug it out during their lifetime. Some of them are arboreal. They live up in the trees. And some of them will occupy many different spaces, maybe under rocks or will come together in groups in order to stay warm during the cold portions of the year. So all different types of animals, all that biodiversity is working to make sure that their adaptation, adaptations are allowing them to be successful in their given environments. All right, Woo. Darwin is getting very excited for our next guests. They are coming to us from REI Dublin, Liz Hall and Tim Glebe, and they are going to be telling us more about some useful and delicious camping tips. Hey, I'm Tim. Hey, I'm Liz. And we're coming to you from Dublin REI. Normally, we'd be in the store with you, but tonight we're coming to you virtually. So I want to give a shout out to the Cal Academy for giving me a reason to shave my face and put on a colored shirt. I thank you, and my girlfriend thanks you. You look good, Tim. Thank you. Um, hey, so we have been sheltering in place for a little while. Um, if you're like me, you're itching to get out there and hit the trails, maybe camp, just, you know, change it up a little bit. Um, before we share these hacks with you, I just want to call out Recreate Responsibly. Um, hit up bayareaoutdoors.org for a whole bunch of tips. Um, right now, Recreate Responsibly means know before you go, plan ahead, make sure the trails, the campgrounds you're going to are actually open and can have visitors. Um, stay, close, stay close to home as well. We have all of these amazing regional parks right here in the backyard of the bay. Now is a great time to check some of those out if you haven't already. When you're on the trails, practice some physical distancing, play it safe, make sure we're not adding any extra stress to um, healthcare networks. And as always, make sure you leave no trace. Tim, what hacks you got for us? Okay, all right, thanks for the good info. All right, so tonight we're gonna talk about three hacks to enhance your trail time this upcoming season. We chose these hacks because you can use them on the trail or at home. So the first hack we're gonna talk about is making a quick camp cocktail. The second hack we're gonna talk about is making a lightweight sleep system. And our third hack will be a delicious, easy trail side meal. So let's jump into our first hack. Today we're gonna to be making a cherry old fashioned 
with a simple powder mix. So the powder mix, this small, weighs nothing. Instructions on the back, but I think you can figure it out. There's a water fill line. I think you can figure that one out too. So super easy, peel it off, throw it into an empty container. Got it. After a long day of hiking. Well, I brought all this booze also. Um, a lot of people do actually like to bring a little bit of booze when they're hiking. Um, if you're doing a weekend trip, pretty easy. You can always bring um, a flask. We've got some cool plastic flasks if uh, you want to save some weight. Uh, if you're sharing on the trail, uh, something a little bit larger, soft-sided water bottle can work really well. All right. So since it's a cherry drink, we brought some cherries for our trail side. All right. One in there. Okay. We're going to pour some water. All right, Liz, and top it off. Okay, so after a long day of hiking, there's nothing more refreshing than a warm cocktail. Tim, I don't care if I'm hiking. I don't want a warm cocktail. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> um, I couldn't figure out a way to pack in ice. All right, so I don't have a hack for packing in ice, um, but I do have a trick if you backpack in some drinks and you want to chill them off before having them at your campground. Um, when I camp, I bring an extra dry bag. Uh, Tim, I actually brought a beer just in case you didn't want to share your cocktail, okay. uh, but since we made a double, maybe we're good. All right. Um, so grab something like your beer, grab your cocktail mix, drop all of this in your dry bag. Um, when I'm choosing a campground, I like to make sure that I have access to water, preferably running water. Um, I don't camp closer than 200 feet to it, but that way I can go down and get some water um, for dinner or whatever else I need. Um, what I'm going to do now, if I was on the trail, I would take my dry bag and I would go dunk it in that um, running river, which likely is cold water, and I'd let it just sit there for 10 or 15 minutes, set up the rest of my camp, and then I can go grab those drinks later and they will be a little bit colder. Um, one thing to remember with that, definitely either hold on to your drinks or tie them off. Uh, you don't want your uh, dry bag of booze running down the river. Um, you don't want any drunk animals and you want to have your drink at the end of the day. Okay. So we'll set this aside. All right. Okay. Thanks for that tip, Liz. Yeah. Okay. So for our second hack, we're going to talk about a lightweight sleep system. So Liz, I think you brought a tent today. Tried and true backpacking tent, taking it on probably a thousand miles at this point. Pretty comfy. How much does it weigh? Like three pounds. It's not too bad. That's pretty heavy these days for a, a sleep system. Um, so okay. I'm going to show you an alternative uh, to the tent. There's always a time and a place for the tent. You know, if you check the weather and it's going to rain, or if you're worried about Darwin slithering into your tent to stay warm at night, um, that is, that's a reason why you would have a tent. But today we're going to talk about the Eno Double Nest hammock system. So over the years, I've always been a little jealous of seeing people on the trail uh, in a hammock system. They look super comfortable. So this hammock system weighs two pounds. Uh, it has a 400 pound capacity. It's a two person hammock. So if you have a quarantine buddy, you can jump in there with them. Or if you're going solo, you're going to have a little extra room. Hey, so Tim, we've got this set up in the store with the sand. Um, I'm not always gram counting. I'm not always the lightest uh, backpacker. I want to bring my luxuries in. I'm not backpacking in a stand ever. Yeah, that sounds crazy. So you're going to have to find two trees or two large rocks to set up your link system. You know, this is really convenient because it has the holes sewn into it. So you can pick different dis distances and different widths of structures to adhere to. So that's pretty awesome. Um, so definitely, you know, like trees in Golden Gate Park, something like that, you might be able to figure that out. I did actually hear of one person who managed to hook one side up to their SUV, probably wouldn't try it on a smaller car, hook the other side up to a tree or a pole or something like that, and they took a nap while they're waiting for their friend. Okay, good call. You know, you can also buy a wall hanger for it and put it on a stud at your house in a room so you could use it at home also. So... I also like it because it keeps, uh, keeps you off the ground, you know, because of Darwin and because of dating ants, because you don't want those to come underneath you. Um, you know, we put the bug net on it to keep the mosquitoes out. Maybe some 
there you go tree snakes also you know you can also put the lights on it so people can see where you're sleeping at night so you can see where you're sleeping and give you a little extra light so i would say those lights can be super helpful if you do get up in the middle of the night you walk away um and then if you can't it's dark you can't find your um, hammock again having those lights on can be really helpful so you can find your way back um tim you know i'm really glad you actually brought up that mosquito net uh, one of the first times I took a new friend backpacking, she was going super lightweight, just had like a basically a school backpack. And we went up to Hetch Hetchy um, out in Yosemite, huge body of water there, beautiful campsite. She was so excited to jump in her hammock at the end of the night, woke up the next morning and her back was like just polka dots, um, bug bites everywhere. She had like at least 50 mosquito bites. She was really great about it. It didn't ruin the trip. Um, but a mosquito net probably would have been a good addition for her hammock setup. Yeah, I've learned the hard way with mosquitoes too. You know, they can get so thick that they can crawl into your mouth, which is a horrible, horrible feeling. <laughs> okay, so we went over our camp cocktail. We made up our simple, lightweight sleep system. So for our third hack, we're going to talk about a trail side meal. You know, the fresh trail side meal is the way to go. So I over the years have been taking backpacking food. Dehydrated, light, efficient, tons of calories. You can get ones with tons of protein. But over the years, they have become a little dry. Definitely a little dry, even when you add your water. Um, they also have two servings in them. But Tim, I'm not really down to share a backpacking meal. Sometimes like I'm up for sharing food on the trail, but if you offer me half your backpacking meal, like. I just don't want that. Yeah. Um, but instead, I'm going to show you how to make um, a camp pizza. You can definitely do this in the backcountry. Um, you can do it on a shorter trip. Um, you might be able to swing on a longer trip, but this is great for like a like one night or up to like a probably like three or four overnight. Um, pretty easy. I also want to say Tim and I have been in the store for the past two months shipping product out to you guys. We've shipped out all of our backpacking food. So either you are super excited to go backpacking and you're already prepped for your season, or some of you are eating backpacking food while you're at home sheltering in place. And I just want to tell you, you have options other than your beef stroganoff. Maybe put the backpacking food away and try a couple other things. Good advice. Okay. Good advice. All right. So you can do this in a pot or a skillet. Um, I bring just a couple tiny containers. These are little plastic containers and I've just got olive oil in here. Um, not a huge fan of scrubbing pots at home. Definitely don't want to do it on the trail either. So I'm going to make sure that I fully coat uh, the bottom of the pot in oil, run it around a little bit. Cool. All right. For your dough, you have options. Let me make sure I don't spill the rest of that. That'd be sad. Um, one thing you can do for your dough, you can do biscuit. Uh, just like quick bake biscuits. Um, this is really good, flaky, delicious. Um, good option. Definitely is a little bit heavier, but I guess if you're going Tim's way and you're taking that hammock, then maybe you have some extra weight or you have some extra space since you're not carrying a tent. Um, the other thing that you can do, um, you can make it home. You can make a mix of um, your, um, your dry ingredients, your flour, yeast, and salt. Bring this in a Ziploc bag add water, knead it. This does take longer, so you want to do this before you make your camp cocktails um, and then set up your tent and come back to this later. This is a really good option also. Um, for tonight, we're going to go ahead and use um, the biscuit version. So take a couple of those. This I would put the extra in my uh, Ziploc bag. Remember at elevation, that thing will pop really big. So this is definitely one of those meals that is a good meal after a long day of hiking. Um, and this is a lot of biscuits, so you might want to go ahead, wait one second, um, and make sure that you are sharing this with someone else. So inside the pot, I'm just kind of kneading all of this dough, connecting it, work it down a little bit. With the dehydrated food, you just boil water, pour it in the bag, and walk away. So, okay. A little bit less effort. I usually bring a little towel so I can wipe my hands on it as well. But I promise you, this is going to taste way better. 
Um, so I have another little plastic tube here and I just put tomato paste in it um, out of a can. You can bring the can in a little can opener if you want as well. Um, you also can find like squeeze paste tomato dispensers or tubes basically. Um, just whatever works best. So just pouring this in on top. All right. So that was all pretty easy. Um, all of my extra stuff, I have a bear can. I'm dropping all this in here as well. I put my garbage in there as well. That way I make sure I'm practicing, leave no trace. All right, so I've got my red sauce, got my dough. Last step, cheese. You can't have a pizza without cheese. These ones are actually really cool because they're wax coated. Um, so it's okay if you don't have them in the fridge the whole time. I actually took these on the day and tea for like 21 days. Favorite meal the whole time I was on there. Every time I pulled one of these out, I was so excited. I had like literally allotted three per day. So they fast the entire time as part of my snack time. One of the girls I was hiking with every single time I pulled them out, she was like, can I have some? Can I have some? Which like, I don't mind sharing food. I'm gonna share my pizza with you, but come on. I, this was like my favorite part of the day. Every single time I pulled them out. She wanted some, and I usually gave them to her, but at the end of the trip, I was like, "I these are my last ones. I don't want to share them. That's going to go over so well. So I have a friend that vacuum seals a ribeye steak, freezes it, puts it into the deepest, darkest corner of his pack, and will wait till day five or six to pull out a raw steak and cook it over the fire. I'm always jealous of that guy. And he he does not share yeah um that's fair i probably wouldn't want to share if i was in that situation either so i'm just tearing the cheese putting it on top sliding a little bit so you guys can see what's going on inside all right we'll drop the rest of that in um so i can definitely tell i did a good job with the oil since it's sliding around a little bit not really worried about it sticking got my handy little can towel and my favorite part of this, actually, you can use a lid, but oil actually works really well, and I can use this for multiple runs. I'm going to cover this. Um, we've just got a pretty basic um, camp stove here. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to turn this on. Um, this actually really only takes like five to ten minutes. Um, we're inside the store, so we're not going to turn it on, but you would turn this on. And then, as you can see, there's a central flame area. So rather than like Tim, dehydrate, walk away, do something else, um, you actually do want to keep an eye on this one. You want to use the handle and just make sure that you're moving the pot around so you're getting a really nice even coat of it. About 10 minutes or so, you'll actually hear like the crust sizzling a little bit and will start to smell really good. Um, I'm not going to make you guys sit here and watch me cook this for 10 minutes, but I do want to show you what the finished product looks like. All right. I pre-made one. Inside pizza. All right. All right. And we all have those extra little like pizza things, uh, red peppers hanging around from when you ordered pizza. If you like some extra spice, drizzle those on top. Garbage in my bear can. Right, right. Pizza. Pretty cool. I'm going to need a drink with that. All right. Okay. I have a big my mug. I'm going to split some with you. Okay. So today we went over our three camp hacks to enhance your summer trail time. You know, remember your camp cocktail, your lightweight sleep system and a trail dinner definitely a lot of good ways to make sure you're enjoying your camp time um just want to call it really quickly if you have your own um, camping hacks and you want to share those with us hit us up on instagram tag the rei account uh, we're also on conversations.rei.com um, we have a bay area forum there i'm going to post my uh, recipe for my um, pizza dough that i take when i'm backpacking there um, we'd love to see some photos of any of the hacks that you're doing all of these are intended. You can do them in your backyard. You can you can make this instead of your dehydrated beef stroganoff inside your house, or you can do it on the trail this summer. Uh, make sure you recreate responsibly and check out bayareaoutdoors.org for some good tips as well. Okay, stay safe and recreate responsibly. Cheers. Cheers.
Thank you, Liz and Tim. Definitely gonna use those camping hacks um, when we're able to go out and into the outdoors once again. I would argue that although Darwin, fair, you wouldn't allow him into your um, shelter, he wouldn't really share his food either. Snakes will swallow their prey entirely whole since they don't have any limbs. They can only really just go for the whole thing. So I would understand that you probably wanna bring your own stuff, bring your own pizza, bring your own stroganoff if you need to, because Darwin, if he is your camping buddy, he is definitely not going to share his meal with you. All right, folks, we are going to head to our last part of our virtual nightlife. Once again, we are heading over to Melvin Sings as he serenades us once again, featuring our own Coral Reef live cam.
Oh, thank you so much, Melvin. That was truly beautiful. I uh, just like to make a quick correction. That was not our Coral Reef Live camera. It was actually some video from the Coral City camera. So if you are interested, again, feel free to go and uh, visit and see all of the action that's happening there all the time. Although maybe not quite at this moment, it's a little bit dark over in Florida, but definitely when it starts to lighten up and you're able to see all the wonderful biodiversity that can be found in that coral reef. But that does conclude volume five of Virtual Nightlife. We wanna thank you all so much for joining us this evening. We hope that um, we are here for you during this time when we're all stuck indoors for the most part and bringing you that connection to the outdoors as much as possible. You can. Join us again for some more wonderful content. We actually have a nightlife programming every Thursday at 7 p.m. right here. TM, 7 p.m. Pacific time. I want to make sure that you know, in case you're tuning in from outside of California or the Bay Area here with us. Um, but virtual nightlife will be back in two weeks with a space theme and Night School will be back next week with a making of our planetarium show, Expedition Reef. Now, before we fully sign out and let you all get back to your evening or morning, wherever you may be in the world, I wanna address one last thing. Many of you have heard about the impacts to the Academy staff due to the COVID closure that we announced earlier this week. And we wanted to thank you all for your overwhelmingly warm responses and support for those who've asked about how they can help and are able to comfortably do so, donations to our relief fund, or if you're local, new members are especially welcome during this time. We'll drop the links to you both in the comments section and wanna thank you so much again for your support in no matter what form it takes. We truly appreciate it. We truly appreciate you be parting, being part of our community, our family, and we hope to see you all soon in person um, as soon as we can. But until then, we are still going to be here for you. We're going to continue to explore and explain and sustain life on earth as much as we can. So thank you all so much once again, and we hope you have a good evening. Goodbye, everyone.